Hello, you delicious, tangible thing, person, I don't know. Welcome back to J-Mick, my name is Jack the Snack That Smiles Back, and here are today's stories for you all. A lot of ATAR and some today I fricked up as well as diving into relationship advice. As always, thank you so much for watching, please enjoy the video, and I'll see you on the end. Am I the a-hole for getting my mother banned from my place of work? My mother and I have never gotten along. Like, at all. I'll spare the details, but life with her when I was growing up was, most of the time, not fun in the slightest. She kicked me out of her house a little over two years ago, and we haven't really talked much since. A little bit of words that we've exchanged after that has just been us arguing, her calling me a failure, threatening me, etc, etc. I can never bring myself to block her number and move on with my life because well, there's always the hope that she'll become a better person. But so far, I've been unlucky. Oh, don't you worry. I've read enough of these stories to know the mothers will always eventually change for the better. We had a somewhat decent conversation, at least for us, a few months back for the first time in longer than I can remember. Somewhere in there, I mindlessly, and accidentally, mentioned the name of the store I work at, which is a place she used to frequent quite a bit. Upon hearing this, she told me she would start coming back to that store again so I could get her special discounts and whatnot. I told her that's not exactly how it works there, and that it was pretty ridiculous for her to use me for a discount. The conversation quickly turned into yet another argument. She said some pretty nasty things that I really wish I never heard come out of anyone's mouth, let alone my own mother's. I had been thinking about getting a no contact order against her for a while, just for my own peace of mind and reassurance that she wouldn't track my house down. She doesn't know where I live, for obvious reasons, and start drama or some other outlandish schmidt that she's done before. After this conversation, I finally put into action and started looking into things I can legally do to keep her away from me, at least for the time being. The next day, I explained what was happening to my manager. I told her that my mother frequents our store, and since we got into an argument, there's a very real chance she will come in and cause conflict. I asked if it was possible for me to stay in the back room and have someone else cover for me until she leaves if I ever see her coming into the store. It's unlikely she would cause any trouble if she didn't see me in there. My manager, being the absolute saint that she is, immediately agreed. She seemed genuinely concerned for me and really seemed like she wanted to help. She then told me that because of the severity of the situation, my mother is absolutely not allowed into the store under any circumstances. I personally didn't see why it was necessary to completely ban her altogether, but my manager insisted that my safety and everyone else's comes first, which I understand. I was talking to a close friend about everything, and he seemed to think that completely banning her was a bit extreme. He insisted I shouldn't bring personal matters into a work setting, and that it seemed like I was letting my personal dislike for my mother get in the way of running a store. I considered what he said, and while I still want to believe I didn't do any wrong, I'm starting to think maybe I shouldn't have said anything in the first place. So, am I the a-hole? People's thoughts. Not the a-hole, I'm guessing your friend has no idea what it's like to have a toxic parent, but you need to feel safe at work regardless of your friend's lack of experience in life. Most agree, but then mention that the manager's reaction is rather extreme, like banning your mother from the store would be a more reasonable solution after your first solution of staying in the back room is shown to be completely ineffective. And I kind of agree, yes words, especially them from your mother, can be cruel and disheartening, but it's not like she's actually put you in any literal danger. But this sounds more like on your manager really for making this rule. You mean explained your situation. You didn't say to have a ban, you just mentioned that you'd like to be in the back room during that time. But for the sake of the argument here, let's assume that she did actually say that she wanted her mum banned. I would, and I'm totally understanding that this can be argued, say you're the a-hole. Only assuming that you don't ever even attempt the previous option of just staying in the back and staying away when she ever comes into the store. After all, there's no evidence that she isn't able to compose herself around you while in the store. I think you should at least give that chance first before jumping the gun. Next story is, am I the a-hole for not defending my friend's religious beliefs? As someone who studies the philosophy of religions with a keen interest in epistemology, I was recently put at a crossroads during a discussion that popped up between a group of college mates who began advocating with a rather uh, jam slam phobic fervor. I have no idea if that was demonetizable, but we're gonna find out. <laughs> Topics ranging from the problems with the practice of covering up of the female skin in a predominantly Islamic cultures to the practice of kurbani, the practice involved in the making of halal meat. 
Despite being exposed to the line of rational, unbiased thinking in philosophy, I do find myself at agreement with these criticisms. I used the phrase space jam phobic fervor previously as their opinions were derived out of plain prejudice rather than a well-pondered conclusion. While not hating the religion, I do find myself at moral odds with certain parts of their rationale. This is a lot of big words just to simply say they don't like the religion. I mean, it's okay, buddy. People are allowed to disagree on things. Now to the part where I might be the potential ah! One of my close friends, being a Muslim, tried to counter their rhetoric and looked at me for support, but all I could manage was some feeble comments on how they need to read more on the literature before criticizing and stuff. After the episode, my friend basically ghosted me, calling me a I slam a phone, B! as I had successfully defended the case for the religion at several debates, and that I backed out now only because it wasn't a competition and that this was where my true ideologies came to light. So, dear people of Reddit, we get it, you're fancy! Am I the a-hole for not supporting my friend when I could? So obviously this is a bit of a debate on religion itself as well, so people's comments are rather thick. <laughs> but bear with me, they're rather insightful. Nata, every facet of our thoughts and opinions are open to debate, except religion. For some reason, we're supposed to respect other folks' religions no matter how foolish or ridiculous they are. I suspect that, at reason, at its core, is that those with faith-based convictions ultimately know in their heart of hearts that their ideas are silly and have to detent to avoid pointing this out. If your friend can't defend his beliefs, he should change them. On the other hand, no a-holes here. What's to defend other than someone's right to choose their own beliefs? I disagree with almost every religion, but people get to pick what they believe in, follow, and practice. The only ones I'll openly decry, though, are anything that prevents children from getting medical care. No, you are the a-hole. You stood there, as you say, able to defend your friend, and let a bunch of others continuously spew, as you say, uninformed, jam slam the phone beak prejudices. This isn't okay, even if your Muslim friend wasn't there in the line of fire. Whether they agree with the religion or not, there is no need for that thingy. Just think of how your friend must have felt. All these people ganged up, ripping apart his belief system and being douches for no reason. And the one person he depended on to make it stop, who could make it stop, allowed them to continue. Another comment says, you can't have it both ways. You can't study religion in an unbiased way and still agree with the phobia's views. You are a phobic and you are using the pretext of education to make yourself look less like a bigot. This honestly seems like a story where this person's just been thrust to join in in an argument for the sake of the argument when nothing was really gonna change. But that last comment does make me ponder about this person's stance in general. Does being educated in religions excuse you from having any sort of biased thoughts and criticisms towards a certain religion? Religion. After all, the arguments about women having to cover their skin and such is something that a lot of other religions actually do. I mean, they you know what nuns are, right? So you can argue this person is just trying to use their big brain to not sound like a, you know, simple bigot, but uh, I'll leave that up to you. What do you think down below? Next story, am I the a-hole for not wanting to take care of my mom when she gets old and sick? Basically, the argument started with my mom asking if, when she gets old, if I take care of her. I answered with, if I have to, kind of tone. She's married to my dad and they have each other, but right now, at this moment, if she got sick, I, it feels like I'd have to. Like, I'd drop everything for her. I kind of feeling like a schmitty person because I tend to do my own stuff away from the family, like go out with friends or not wanting to go on family trips. I love my mom and she does a lot for me, but she can be sometimes really mean and like hurtful. I don't know, I tend to have this complicated thing with being my own and being there for family. What's your guys' thoughts on just doing what you want? Straight to the comments, Nata. Although this is very complicated, she shouldn't expect you to just drop everything for her. You have your own life. All people who have to be alone or taken care of by working strangers are sad, but sometimes that's how it has to be. You can't be entirely responsible for another person, especially as you're not a professional. Honestly, this story just sounds like it was something your mother was asking just to know how much you love her in a less direct way. I mean, it kind of makes me want to say you're tart just because of how ignorant you were to it. Like, <laughs> come on, she, she clearly just wants to hear that she's loved. But I do agree with the rhetoric that, hey, just because you had a kid doesn't mean that they owe you their constant attention when you get old and with it. Not so much because I fully believe in children to have, you know, free autonomy over themselves when they're adults, but mainly because of the exact point the last comment made. The we're not professionals in how to take care of people. I would genuinely rather my mom have a like a professional carer than me. Not just because I know I'd suck at it, but 
Yeah, because I'd suck at it. Moving on from the realization, I'll probably have to be dealing with that in the next 10 years. Am I the a-hole for refusing to contribute to my sister's life-saving surgery? I grew up with two sisters, and another sibling who was my brother at the time, and is now the oldest sister. That is the only sibling my parents have ever cared about, and they made it clear. They only had the rest of us to try for more sons. Oh, so wait, even the one that is their son changed to be a sister instead. Well, not like she didn't choose to. That was who they were deep inside. But that must <laughs> suck it, parents. See where favoritism gets you. Everything she wanted and needed was provided for. She played every sport, had the equipment, private coaching, and my parents attended every match. Okay, just gonna say here quick that that's, uh, that that's pretty good. You want your parents to do that for you. Though I guess just probably not at the expense of ignoring your other children, but I mean. She and her sports friends made our lives miserable, especially me, because I developed early and they called me udders and teats. Mocking my chest, my butt, my haunches, every part of my appearance and clothing. They were treated like royalty in our house, and there was no escaping them. My parents were trying to live their high school dreams through them. My other sisters and I never got anything new, and things like dental work were considered extras for us. We were always told there was no money for extras. My younger sister developed a chronic condition she never saw a doctor for until she was an adult with her own health plan. My eldest sister went on from being a high school, college athlete, frat member, and a-hole into developing a nasty drug and alcohol addiction. My parents drained their savings sending her to rehab after rehab, which she started but left early to relapse. Okay, I'm noticing a bit of a red flag with this whole story. I mean, that clearly hints to the justification of the bad treatment they were displaying towards you that's clearly being influenced by something else. I don't know, the story's starting to come across like someone really trying to ramp up why the other person's an a-hole so they come across as more of a nice person. Anyway, my personal ignorant assumptions aside, my grandmother died and I was not expecting any will because she was broke and lived in a government-run nursing home, but she was saving something, an earring and necklace set. She left it to me because at that time I was considered the oldest girl in the family. My youngest sister ended up needing surgery for her chronic condition because it had gone on for so many years before being treated. She could not pay the copay, so I sold the earrings to cover it but I still have the necklace. Around this time, our eldest sister revealed herself as being our sister, not brother. I only heard of this through the grapevine because I have been low contact with her for years. She knew I had paid for my younger sister's copay because my younger sister had first gone to my parents for help, but they weren't able to help. And my younger sister let them know that she was able to get the surgery after I sold the earrings. I thought since my older sister was now my sister, my parents would treat us all the same. But now they are even more protective of her, which is better than if they weren't. My older sister has told the family that the reason why she was a mess for all those years was because she was struggling with her gender identity. She said that she needs breast implants in order to feel right with herself and fix her mental health. She said it's a matter of her health and safety and it would be life-saving for her to get them. She apologized for how she treated me growing up and explained why. She wants me to sell the necklace and pay for her breast implants. My parents are telling me I'm banned from the family if I don't do this to save my sister's life. So I'm no expert when it comes to gender reassignment surgery, but I'm... Um, is it really a case of life and unlife if you don't get boobies put on you? I mean, yeah, okay, this is a mental issue, but I feel like if that's how you view the surgery, that alone is the mental health issue you need to be getting checked on first. Anyway, let's see what the comments might say. Only real Yatar is one that just openly criticizes the US's way of medical care rather than actually you and the story, so that's useless. Another point to consider though, if I were to put myself in your shoes, I guess I'd ask myself at the end of the day what I can live with and what I can't. What if you deny her the necklace and she actually does end up dying? Would you feel guilty? Would you be okay or will that leave you with a lifelong regret? Big everyone sucks here vibes. I don't know your financial situation, but refusing to chip in at all because of something out of your sister's control, aka your parents' abuse of y'all, is a really schmitty move. But it's also a schmitty move from her to expect you to provide funds you don't have if that's the case. On the other end, Nata, sometimes being banned is a good thing. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry that I treated you horribly your whole life. Now, will you pay for my cosmetic surgery? Yeah, look, when you dumb it down like that, it definitely sounds really selfish of the uh, sister to demand this of you. 
Am I the a-hole for telling my surrogate to stop acting like she was my husband's wife? My husband and I have been together for five years. We wanted kids, but because of my health problems, this wasn't possible. We decided to go with surrogacy. My friend nominated her sister, Brittany, 29. I agreed right away because I know Brittany and the family. We've set everything up. Discuss payment, short and long-term plans, counseling and doctor appointments. We explored IVF and chose a private clinic to get it done. It started after Brittany took a pregnancy test. She only told my husband though, she had both our numbers. She only sent my husband a pic of the test while he was at work and sent me nothing when I gave her my personal contact info, but it was okay. It wasn't okay. Things got complicated when Brittany started having access to our credit cards for her own wants and claimed they were the baby's needs. She excluded me from doctor's visits and scans and had only my husband go with her. Her excuse was my husband drives and has time since I work and am unavailable most of the time. I felt isolated from this experience, but said nothing knowing she's bearing a lot of burden, so I had patience. My husband had no idea what was going on and if this was normal. This was new to us, so we didn't know. Okay, lady, I don't... Uh... <sighs> Why are you with this man if he is that blind and ignorant to what is going on here? That is... Mm. She's seven months in, and last week she had us visit to discuss things that I thought we'd previously agreed on, but she said she changed her mind about, and her mum was there too. I heard Brittany out and was shocked when she gave a list of how things should be from now on, since she said there was a lot of confusion in the past of me stressing her out by complaining. She requested she gets a say in things like the baby name after I deleted the list of names she sent to my husband. She wanted more access to my husband's credit cards and free time to get stuff done at her place. Also, more time with the baby than agreed on. Then wrapped up by saying only my husband should be with her in the delivery room and use the hospital as excuse. I got up firmly and stated I don't agree with her new terms and that she had to stop acting like she was my husband's wife and that this was their baby. My husband didn't speak till she started crying. He asked me to sit down, but I said I had boundaries, reminded her that her role was and how she overstepped. Her mum went off and said her daughter was being mistreated when she put herself mentally and physically through the most selfless act for us, to make us a family. She gave up a part of her life in those months to give us what we want, and I was acting selfish and ungrateful. She had us leave, then told my friend, and it got more complicated. I was told to apologize for what I said. Am I the a-hole? One edit, yes, we agreed on paying for the surrogacy like I stated above, so no favors or anything. Another edit, no, we did not have a legal contract because my friend said there was no need for us to do that and basically talked us out of it since we are considered family, but we had an agreement including paying her. Oh, okay, so no legal safety net at all, like, oh, well, I mean, that's... That's not too bad. I, hopefully you can just talk it out. Another edit question about whether Brittany had kids of her own. Uh, she was a single mom of a four-year-old who passed away from an accident. Oh no. She had him at a young age, <laughs> but she always seemed in good <laughs> yeah, mental and physical health. You are screwed. One comment highlights the danger zone of this. Surrogates go through extensive psychological evaluation and I have serious doubts she would pass. Opie and husband majorly dropped the ball here. I mean, that the last edit you've made, I don't know how you've not come across this conclusion yourself. She is clearly trying to just bring herself back into what she lost. Some other thoughts though, Yitta, why the hell would you let her be a surrogate after she's lost a four-year-old kid? That's just asking for problems. Also, no contract? Child is legally hers then, no? Yeah, this is above Reddit's pay grade. You fricked up by not getting a contract. Again, I think we are all just ignoring the other factor here of just how really blind the husband's being to all this. I mean, he he has to be playing a part, like, surely. How is he not put two and two together what this woman's trying to do? Anyway, next story. Am I the a-hole for refusing to attend my brother's wedding after my sister-in-law left my two-month-old on a park bench? So me and my sister-in-law have always been close. Her and my brother met when they were 15, I was 12, and I'm now 21. 
She was always really nice to me and we bonded over the fact that my parents don't like either of us. A few weeks ago, I got called into work and my sister-in-law said that I shouldn't waste money on a babysitter when I could just let them take care of her for a bit. My husband was also at work. I guess at some point she decided to take her and her dog for a walk. She says they were walking through the park and the leash slipped out of her hand. Now, without thinking, she put my daughter on a nearby bench, as she was in a little carrier, and she ran after the dog. She didn't even catch the dog. It wasn't until two hours later that she even realized that my daughter was missing. When I came to pick up my daughter, she broke down and told me everything. I was livid. But I was so thankful no one kidnapped her. My husband was so mad, he stormed down to their house just to yell at her. She recently messaged me details about her wedding. I told her I would not be attending. Now she called me, sobbing, saying that I'm a petty birch and she wishes someone had have kidnapped my daughter. I hung up on her and she apologized and said she needs me there. My friends and family have called me saying I'm petty and that she was stressed and if it was an accident. So am I the a-hole? Not the a-hole. Kill the dog. You're the a-hole for saying had of. <laughs> it's okay, not many people are taking this one very seriously. Ah, uh, Yita, she's family. She fricked up and was remorseful about it. Uh, yes, a huge frick up, but she's family. Are you going to ruin a relationship for a lifetime because she fricked up once? Oh, not the a-hole. Oh my god. God, doing that is absurd, but her statements after really sealed the deal. So yeah, I'm gonna stand on the side of Yatar just because you're basing her behavior as gospel when it was clearly a knee-jerk emotional reaction to your statement. Totally right of her to apologize afterwards, which she did. But yeah, she literally groveled at you. She dealt with your husband ramming her a new one. I, I think it's fair to say she's learned her lesson and is definitely not gonna dare let herself get caught up in that again. Especially with how close you seem to been throughout your life together, I feel like you are being rather petty. Over to some people who fricked up, this one belongs in horny jail. So I matched with a cute woman on Tinder and right away she's into me and I'm into her. We share our snaps and continue the conversation there. Things start heating up and she suggests we do some stuff together over video chat. I say sure, I've never done it before but I'll try it. So we're getting hot together and then she shows that she recorded it my face with my pee pee in my hands. At this point, I know I'm fricked. I have a relatively uncommon name and she found me on all of my socials. She then proceeded to threaten release of the video if I don't pay an exorbitant amount of money I don't have. I explain it as such and she says she doesn't care. So I reach out to my brother who might be able to help me out financially. When I tell him what's going on, we're close, he said don't pay. I wasn't doing anything illegal and chances that the video does get sent to all my Facebook friends and Twitter followers is actually somewhat small as long as I delete it before she can post. So I then deleted all of my socials as simultaneously as I could. This was an hour ago. I haven't gotten any texts from anyone asking about it yet so my fingers are still crossed. So there you are, a little short story but a nice little public reminder folks. Make sure you meet up with someone first before you start doing the deed together online. Next story, is my birthday gift to my boyfriend emasculating? Look, as long as it's not long, phallic and vibrates, I'm sure you're fine. Unless he's into that and takes it like a man. I've been with my boyfriend for five years and his big 30th is coming up soon. I know he loves a football team and I am planning to get him a 21, 22 kit with his favorite player's name. But in the last few years, he's felt lost in his career and life battling depression. In this period, he wasn't working, his laptop broke, and he hasn't been able to fix it. His laptop used to provide a daily source of escape for him. I would really like to shower him with a vibrant, a uh, MacBook Air, to hit his 30th with a buzz. Uh, bang! Bang! Bear in mind, he's dreading his 30th and what that means for him. This isn't a transactional gift, in, in that I don't expect him to be able to return anything of a similar price range on my birthday. I just genuinely want to give him this gift. So I come to Reddit after being told by a girlfriend that this gift is too much and may appear emasculating because of the price tag. Please advise on whether it could be misconstrued and I should opt for another gift. Okay, uh, hang on. I'm sorry, who is this friend of yours and... Who has been telling her that getting something expensive for a guy is somewhat gay? Fellas, is it... <laughs> is it gay to get something expensive? What? 
I don't, I don't know how to even answer that. That's really changing my perspective on guys who own expensive gaming computers. Next story. I'm considering breaking up with my girlfriend over her past, being told that I'm misogynistic. Should I? So I'm a 24 year old male and I've been dating my girlfriend who we will call Sarah, who's also 24, for almost three years. Our relationship seemed great for the majority of this time. We started dating toward the end of college and she started working in her field of study, healthcare, while I am in graduate school. We do not live together, but she had discussed moving in with me in the past. We rarely fight and when we did, it was minor and we both got over it quickly. She seemed pretty happy in our relationship, and I know I was. This made the events that transpired over the past few days very difficult. One day last week, I awoke to some texts from our mutual friend, alias Sam23, that bizarrely were only screenshots with no additional context of a text conversation between her and Sarah from two years ago. They were discussing different men they had been involved with in the past. To be blunt, there was a lot of back and forth about various attributes of the men they had been with, and Sarah compared me unfavorably with some of the other guys she was with. Specifically, she said I was all right in bed and a little small. There was a lot of other very in-depth comparisons about different acts that I don't want to recount. I'm not here to boast or mope about the size of my pee pee, mostly because before this, I thought it was average, at five and a few quarters inches roughly. Which is actually above average, just saying. 5.4, that's the universal average. So there you go, guys. You can rest, you rest easy now. But her calling it small definitely stung. She has always seemed happy to have it on with me and usually orgasms when I give her oral. We had that stuff two to three times a week. She never once brought up anything negative about it. What surprised me even more than this is later in the conversation, she said she had been with about 25 guys before me. I was surprised by this even though I never specifically asked her. Obviously, I knew she had it on with other people, but I, I never asked for a number. I never thought to. I honestly didn't know people did this. The text conversation was really long, and they talked about the best guys they slept with. I'm not going to get into specifics, and she wasn't trashing me horribly, but she definitely made it clear that I wasn't her best lover or even in the top tier. I realize I'm probably not some god, I'm a pretty rational person, but I was still really hurt by this. I didn't understand why she felt the need to compare me with other men in the conversation with her friend. Later, I found out they were having a row over Sarah not being able to give her a ride when she was having car issues. This is why Sam sent me this conversation, I guess out of revenge. That evening, Sarah came over to my place and I showed her the conversation. She immediately got defensive. She said that I was insecure, that it wasn't that important to our relationship, and that I was a misogynist for trying to hold this against her. I told her I wasn't comfortable with her publicly shaming me like this, and that the worst part of it was sharing it with other people. I told her I can't control what she thinks, but I don't want the size of my pepepepe to be circulating in our friend group. I also told her that I was a little worried that I could have contracted an STD and that 25 people seems like a lot of people to have it on with at 22. She went nuts after I said this and basically left my house screaming at me, calling me insecure and jealous. She also said later via text that she thinks it is abusive for me to demand that she can't speak about certain subjects with her friends. I'm wondering if I'm in the wrong for thinking these things and I'm considering ending the relationship now. I'd like to hear other people's take as all her friends are contacting me, telling me how much of a jerk I am. Thank you for reading. Notable edit, uh, one question I tried to ask her during the confrontation was if she got an STD test prior to being sexual with me. Uh, didn't get an answer. So I want to highlight that edit because despite the clearly stupid thought that just because she slept with a bunch of guys that, it's, you know, that's why you should break up with someone. Yeah, no, there's no difference between having it on 50 times with the same guy and having it on once with 50 different guys. Your pee-pee don't get shriveled up and all withered by the amount of times you're in tight patang, and women don't get all loose and open by the amount of times they get it on. It seems his main issue with that was just the safety of sexual health. To which that is totally justified. If you've had it on with a lot of people, you should be keeping track of your sexual health. But this comment does highlights the fact that this is really being driven by ego in the very fact that hey if she said that you were amazing and she was like completely infatuated with how good you were in the bed would you still want to break up with her 
Likely not, because this is more insulting towards your ego than it is about the whole trust of private conversations. Meanwhile, others highlight the fact that, hey, she shouldn't be talking about what she doesn't like about you in front of other people. It's one thing to discuss your lives of that matter to your friends, but you don't make fun of your partner nor compare them to previous experiences so openly to others. Now that said, I don't think there's enough evidence here that actually proves she was genuinely thinking of it this way when having this conversation. So look, here's the truth, guys. Okay, a lot of girls, they are gonna settle. Women habitually settle for men in relationships. Notably because, and guys, let's be truthful about this, the dating pool of men is pretty pathetic. Only about 20% of us actually take care of ourselves to the same degree that 80% of women do. So most would just rather settle down with someone that, hey, he's not as hot, but at least he's around and loves me, versus constantly competing with everyone else to find some hot guy that actually meets their fantasy. You can accuse that of being dishonest, but hey, if they're happy with you, is it really dishonest? But more importantly in this factor, gentlemen, again, big PP isn't the best PP. Ask any of your female friends, if you have any. I guarantee that they prefer an average or at least slightly above average PP to like something that's seven and a half to eight or nine inches. You can have the biggest gun, but if you don't know how to use it, you're just gonna shoot yourself in the foot. And I imagine with something that's nine inches, that'd be pretty messy. And just as there are different sizes of PP, there are also different tightness and sizes of women's vagina. I personally know numerous women out there who actually genuinely prefer a guy who has nothing bigger than maybe 5.2 inches. The adult content you watch is not proper health education, my friend. Let's just mention something that the OP does mention in the story here. She gets orgasm when he gives oral. It is very likely she is someone who does reach that stimulation through the clit and not through actual PP in her. Like, honestly, dude, if you've been dating for more than a year and she hasn't left you yet, then you must be doing something well in the bedroom. Especially if you've been getting it on two to three times a week. Now, that said, <laughs> the very fact she's gone to her friends to talk about this rather than actually just talking to you and trying to teach you things that she likes or enjoys. Yeah, she's an absolute a-hole, but you are also an idiot to confront her like this. I mean, clearly she didn't feel like you'd be comfortable to be, I guess, confronted yourself about this aspect of the relationship. Of course, the first thing someone does when you show them a bunch of text messages from the past is that they get defensive. It's such a legitimate emotional response. You were the one in power here. You, you should have taken the responsibility of just listening to her and letting her know that, you know, you weren't really upset about specifically the fact of sharing the story, but the fact that you just felt so inadequate. That is clearly what you're striving for in this relationship, and clearly you just had the opportunity to clarify that with her. But instead, as some of the comments mentioned, you let your ego get in the way. This could have been a great opportunity for you to both grow and develop a better understanding of each other's just position in the sexuality of your relationship. But both of your egos actually got in the way of this opportunity and now you both screwed each other over. Just not in the fun kinky way like you normally do. Anyway, that's my long as hell ramble. Thank you so much for watching. That's going to end today's video. That was really me talking out of my butt at the end there. I'm kind of just drinking a bunch of coffee with some Baileys mixed in. So I don't know if it fully made sense, but I hope it did regardless. Feel free to mention any uh, opposing thoughts in the comments below. I'm totally open ears to it all. I am just one person after all. I am not the gospel of understanding everything. Leaving a like is always appreciated, of course, because it really helps me out with the channel. And with all that said, my name has been Jack. You have been a lovely person to speak to this evening, and I look forward to doing it again soon. Bye-bye!